It was an absolute massacre. Outnumbered, frightened people with no escape, jumping out windows, climbing over fences, barricading doors. We see it starkly, in bold lines, and incredible detail. It's like we are there. Gunpowder, broken windows, and broken pieces of furniture. It's all captured in the best technology of its time. And in 1866, that's the wood block. Ink soaked and laid on a press bed until its tiny truth is presented in thousands of newspapers and magazines. The skilled engraver must draw lightly in reverse, etching white on black ink, the outline of the body strewn on the floor, the broken chair, the window frame with the tell-tale bullet hole, the outline of a man with pistoled hands, others with the shape of clubs. Like a surgeon, he then chooses his instruments carefully and makes very precise cuts, dabs, you might almost say, into that wood block with a burl arched in his hand and fastened by his thumb. He can create microscopic representations of light and the absence of light by cutting into the wood. These wood engraving illustrations could produce a lovely creature, like an etching of a snowy owl, but today it's put to a darker use to relate the terrible murder and terrorism that had just occurred in the city of New Orleans. And you look at it, and you cringe. You see unarmed men being shot in the back, on the ground, or as they climb over a fence, desperately trying to escape. And if you're in the North, you're saddened, you're enraged, you're writing a letter to your congressman, and you want to change and upset the politics of the day, and you will. It's not propaganda either. If anything, the engraver can't fully have you appreciate what it must have been like at this horrible scene in New Orleans, 1866, where a group of people, black and white, gathered to say that regardless of their skin color, all people should vote, all people should be able to run for office and have a say in the politics of the state they live in. But this is not a popular opinion with white citizens of Louisiana at this time. And the first sign of trouble is when all the conventioneers that were supposed to show up don't. A fraction of the convention, not wanting to be judged as a rump, they stop the proceedings and try to find more of their members for a quorum. Where are they? Then rocks at the windows pounding at the door, and they try to lock the main doors inside this giant hall at the Me Mechanics Institute where this meeting's taking place. They burst open, and the intruders fly in, mad with rage, grabbing anyone they can, firing pistols, some dressed as police officers. For those in the convention who had fought in the Civil War, and there were many, they were now facing an army, not unlike the armies they had faced a few years before. The conventioners in the hall try to fight back, grab what they can, broken chair legs, pieces of table, crude weapons, and charged forward to try to push the invaders out. For a short time, they were able to force the main doors and to try to secure it with a wooden table. Twice, they would counter this charge, each time a few of them dropping on the floor. One man, a reverend, holds up a white handkerchief in surrender. He is shot in response. When the wood engraving of that scene will appear in the north, of course it will bring outrage. An American flag is added to his handkerchief. Another conventioner screams at the police, Please arrest us. Take us into your custody. But the police are not here to do police duty. No arrest is offered. James Ford Rhodes, the historian, writes, By them and by others of the white mob, deeds of cruelty and wanton violence were perpetrated. Nearly all the victims, Rhodes indicates, were African American. The police, three quarters of which were ex-Confederate soldiers, and one of them was a notorious thief, had joined the mob instead of quelling the riot. It was no riot 
telegraphed the general in charge of Louisiana at this time, Phil Sheridan. It was an absolute massacre. Rhodes writes this in his 1920 History of the United States, and Rhodes is no fan of Reconstruction. He celebrates when it ended, but even he cannot write about this passage without censure. William McFeely writes in his book on Ulysses S. Grant, clearly the Freedmen's Bureau, the federal agency designed to protect newly enfranchised African Americans, could not even secure the lives of them. One of Grant's favorite generals had been out of the city. His absence had not gone unnoticed by the officials of the Johnsonian city government as they appraised the limits to which they could go. Here's how La Tribune, a newspaper founded by free African Americans in the city of New Orleans during the time of the Civil War, for a while the protesters succeeded to keep at bay the thugs and the police, but they had soon to fall back into the hall. The police made three successive onslaughts into the hall, retreating at each time to load their revolvers. Our friend and brother of race, Victor LaCroix, fell three times, and three times in succession rose up to defend his life with unsurpassed courage. His body was horribly mangled. Victor LaCroix is dead, but Jefferson Davis lives still. It all starts with a hopeful convention in 1864 in the same city, Louisiana, hearing the call of Abraham Lincoln about allowing states who are in the Civil War, who are in the Confederacy or were in the Confederacy, now under Union control, letting them come back into the Union and participate if 10% of them take an oath swearing loyalty to the Union. They can do that here. People in Louisiana realize they can do that. There is a union supporting element in Louisiana. It's not just a crazy idea here, particularly in its major population center, New Orleans. It's got a large foreign born population, 46%. Irish, German, a huge transport population of New Yorkers and Pennsylvanians. Coming down in the last four decades, to America's most vibrant and prosperous city, the place to get rich, really the west of its day, New Orleans. It's got more freed black citizens before the Civil War than in Charleston, Savannah, and Richmond combined. While there are slaves in the city of New Orleans as there are in the entire South, it's only 8% of the population here. And indeed, the city would only be in the Confederacy for 15 months. Not only that, this city and this state have supplied soldiers, mostly Irish and German and African Americans, to the Union cause. General Benjamin Butler, in charge of the city, is a military man, but he's also a Jacksonian politician. He sees the politics here, the craftsmen, the laborers, who have been under the thumb of planters for many, many years. He sees that he can develop a new politics in the state starting with military control, but then can govern the state as a unionist state itself. Butler, under military direction, provides jobs for many of the unemployed craftsmen. He taxes planters and puts 1,100 families on relief. People like Michael Hahn, a successful businessman immigrant from Bavaria, or Benjamin Flanders, who came from Philadelphia in the 1830s, but has lived in New Orleans since then, mobilize their communities and form agreement that they can put together a unionist state constitution, the free state of Louisiana. It does a lot of good things. It makes African Americans equal in, in all senses of the law provides for suffrage, um, regardless of property, allows them to own property, allows them to rent, allows them to save money. But one thing about this constitutional unionist convention of 
Louisiana in 1864, they wouldn't be called radical in the time, the, uh, the way that that's described today and in historical discussions, because they stopped short of one thing. They did not give black citizens the right to vote. In their view, they did not need to, and in 1864 at least, that would have been a radical step for that time. Anyone who had served in the Confederate Army or government, and this is most of the people that this free state government would be against, most of the people causing the problems, would be ineligible to vote because they were disloyal citizens. With the numbers they have, with their large immigrant populations, this free state would control the government anyway. They didn't need additional voters. But in just two years, it was a completely different story. And part of the reason is what happened in New Orleans, and part of the reason is what happened in Washington. And part of the reason is that the war ended. It became an attractive city for former Confederates. Nearly every former general is here, a local resident observed. And that changed the politics of the city. It was an opportunity city, still intact, still Southern, but something else. An assassin's bullet felled Lincoln. And now his vice president, Andrew Johnson, was in his stead. And initially, there was some feeling that Johnson was going to be tougher than Lincoln on prosecuting the South. But that didn't turn out to be so. Johnson hated rich, wealthy planters, but he didn't hate Southerners and generally felt that white men should be running things. So Christmas 1865, he pardoned all people that served in the Confederate Army if they would take an oath, and if they weren't high wealth planters, people who had more than $20,000 in wealth. This sweeping amnesty, the largest pardon on record, completely changed the politics of Louisiana. A Democrat who wants to bring things, you know, to a very different direction than that free state constitution is elected. Lieutenant governor, Democrats control the legislature. The governor is a Republican, but he's a Republican that's starting to pull things away from that army control. Politics changed and black codes were passed, which allowed for contracts, five-year contracts, which very much resembled forms of slavery. Restrictions by parishes could be made on where citizens could go. Another thing that happens, in the city of New Orleans, the mayor, Monroe, who refused to surrender the city and was locked up and in a Union Army prison, after he's released, he's elected mayor once again now now that the amnesty has taken place. He's even concerned when he gets out of prison that he's been elected mayor. Is this for real? And am I really going to be able to do this? And telegraphs the White House. The reassurance comes from President Johnson. There will be no interference by the military in civil matters. So the guy that had been the mayor of the city under secession becomes mayor once again, and he hires his own police chief, and new police officers, many of whom take in Confederate ranks. One day a soldier, now a policeman in the city. The same with the fire department and other city jobs. Once they have these jobs, it's very important to these men that they don't lose them. Governor Wells, who had played as a moderate between the radical and redeemer factions, saw the writing on the wall. He was about to be forced out of office. Governor Wells changed his position on black suffrage, which had been strongly adamant against before. Now he saw there were 28,000 Louisiana black citizens who had served in the Union Army. This was more than double the amount of people that voted in the last gubernatorial election. If these voters could be brought online, Republicans could control the government of Louisiana and force out the Democratic legislature. On the federal level, there are more considerations. They'd be able to elect Republican congressmen long term, and to deny the state's electoral votes to Andrew Johnson if he tried for re-election. But how to do it? The governor couldn't just order it done in this state. The Constitution allowed the legislature to do it, but they weren't going to do it. They were adamantly against it. The only option was to build some new political force 
and they found something. In the convention that had met in 1864, the resolution that sent the Constitution to the voters of of, of Louisiana to approve had an interesting little twist. They were worried that maybe the state wouldn't approve the Constitution, and then what would they do? Have to elect a new convention? No, they wanted to have the same convention revise. There's a clause in the resolutions of the convention that says the president of the convention could reconvene the convention. So the plan was to do that, to reconvene a convention that would create a new government. Now, to many, this idea seemed crazy. Richard Taylor, the son of President Zachary Taylor, who was a Confederate, now living in Louisiana, said, such a body would have no more right to convene a convention than you would have to convene British Parliament in America. Newspapers laughed about it until the governor of the state got involved, called for elections for delegates to the convention from every part of the state. And because the president of the previous convention was not available, not willing to take on the responsibility, he appointed the Supreme Court Justice of Louisiana to convene the convention. Now it's serious. And the mayor of the town orders the arrest of anyone who tries to do a convention. Local judges declared an insurrection and will try anyone and indict anyone. New York Times reporter Edward P. Brooks surveyed people in the local hotels and said the people here are more bitter than any other place I have found. Papers inflamed opinion, too, with strange rumors afloat of secret societies organized without distinction of color and composed of men determined to overthrow the legal government. The New Orleans Times wrote the day before the riot. They made use of secret signs and passwords. The mayor and the local judge who indicted this convention were, quote, doomed, meaning they would be singled out for assassination. The Democratic lieutenant governor who wanted to take control of the Reconstruction government said that squads of black men were now roaming the city. The mayor informs General Bard that he was to clear the meeting and arrest everyone. He's informed by the U.S. general not to do so. Any group had a right to meet and discuss something politically. And in the next three days, there's a mix. In fact, one reporter notes when he talked to the more wealthy people in town, the more cultured people in town, say they weren't much concerned about this convention. But among the lower classes and the types of people who frequent hotels, there is seething talk. Mayor Monroe issued this proclamation. The mayor urges citizens not to go to the Mechanics Institute, avoid with all care, all disturbance and collision. I do call particularly on the younger members of the community to act with calmness and propriety, as that the good name of the city may not be tarnished. This proclamation is in the major newspapers, and some of the newspapers who are against the convention double down on the mayor's statement and say, we also urge as a paper, please don't go. And this is enough for a 1981 Louisiana history article to suggest that Mayor Monroe wanted no riot. Yet it's still up for debate. He employed the cops of the city, after all. And it's possible, and you know, see this with modern eyes now when you look back at things like this, perhaps this is actually a bit more of reverse psychology. You know, don't go to the meeting at the Mechanics Institute, especially not the younger people, uh, maybe less sinister. It's just simply a statement that's issued so that if there is violence, it's not his fault. He did everything to calm down the crowd. Here's what a Louisiana History article in 1981 says. To see the situation otherwise requires viewing all events as part of a Machiavellian and diabolical scheme. Well, uh, we don't need to consult an Italian political genius to understand that a calm note in elite newspapers is not as real as what a New York Times reporter would say, bloody talk in hotels in New Orleans among the lower class of people. It is true, while the mayor was not at the scene at the Mechanics Institute, he did have members of the city council and his secretary there on the scene. Now, there's something else that comes to play in all of this, and that is the telegraph. So while it's not easy to get to, say, Washington, D.C., by horseback uh, or even boat and get the latest news. There is, um, since the 1840s, America has the telegraph technology. So 
you do have different sides telegraphing. And here, it's hard to say whether the telegraph was helpful or not in this situation, because the lieutenant governor and the local court judge are telegraphing Washington and getting from the White House, we will not interfere in what is a court proceeding. But their court proceeding is indicting the people who want to start a constitution, who want to start a convention for a new government, you know, which nowadays we would consider, a, you know, if it wasn't directly violent, a free speech activity. But that's what they get from Johnson. General Bard then telegraphs Edwin Stanton, the Secretary of War, and essentially saying, look, there are people here having a convention. There's people saying it's going to be violent. What should I do? I'm inclined, Bard says, to have a force present there. Here's the problem. In 1866, Edwin Stanton, now Lincoln has been assassinated, Edwin Stanton works for President Andrew Johnson and doesn't have the best relationship with him. If he angers Johnson, he's going to be fired. And there goes control of all the secretary. In fact, later Johnson will fire Stanton, but in a much worse political position, partially because of the events we're talking about. But right now, Stanton doesn't have that upper hand. He elects not to answer Bard's telegraph, figuring that if he doesn't answer, Bard will go and send soldiers there to protect the event anyway. But he doesn't have a um, he doesn't have a record that Stanton told him to do it. We don't know exactly what happens here. The story that is comes out is that he thought this meeting was going to be at six o'clock, so he had the time wrong instead of uh, during the day. And on the other hand, he didn't get a, a yes from his supervisor, so we're not a hundred percent sure. I mean, the existing record in history is that this is a simple matter that Bard got the time wrong, and that unfortunate occurrence led to disaster. The Friday night before, there was a large rally that was also in front of the Mechanics Institute. It's an imposing structure, constructed in 1857 by the famous New Orleans architect, James Gallier Jr. It stood at the riverside of what is now University Place, midway between Canal and Common Streets. The building consisted of three floors, although it was actually four stories high. The main hall, where the Louisiana House of Representatives met, was a large room, two stories high, that ran almost the entire length of the building. Beneath the main hall on the ground floor were a series of smaller rooms used for committee meetings. The Louisiana Senate met in one of these rooms, and the governor of the state of Louisiana had his office located on the floor towards the rear of the building. The presence of this meeting in this august hall gave credence to it. It was a warm night, Friday before July 27th. It's 86 degrees, and a group meets to support this convention that's going to happen some days later, and to get what they need, which is a supportive crowd in front of the Institute the day of the convention, which will help to both show that the public opinion is behind what's being done. And also to protect the people inside. But in order to get a crowd in these days, you don't have social media, right? To get a crowd, you got to have a crowd. So you have a rally in order to set up an organization for a few days later. And this is what they do on that Friday. And there are several speakers, but one of the most powerful speakers is Dr. A.P. Dosti. He was born in New York, French-German descent. He had moved to New Orleans in 1852, but he was forced to flee the city in 1861 after it had declared for secession. He was opposed. Dotsi, a dentist, had returned to New Orleans after it was occupied by Union troops, and he quickly became a strong supporter of the general there, Nathaniel P. Banks, and what he was trying to do. Dusty had worked hard in September 1864 to make sure that the Constitution was ratified. And now, 
the 45-year-old dentist, endorsed reconvening the convention to complete the work it had failed to finish. He's a handsome man by accounts. He had dark, piercing eyes, and he didn't see anything else but the truth in what he said. If you were right, he said, if you are right, you can't be a radical. He told the assembled crowd, You have got your freedom. We have fought for your freedom. Now, will you fight for your votes? We will, we will, the crowd shouted in response, followed by a chant, Fight to vote, fight to vote. Dosti then invited the crowd to come with him on Monday. Show your support for this convention. We will, we will. There are two or three hundred men, mostly African American, after the speeches are done, They start on a torchlight procession from the Mechanic Institute down Canal Street along St. Charles Street to City Hall. More speeches are made there. And there's disputes about this that are going to show up in papers and eventually in the reports of Congress. And some say that what Dosti says at this point is that there are more of us than then we will kill them all. But that's what hostile newspapers and opponents say that Dosti said. What a nephew of one of the victims and what other supporters say is that all Dosti said was, if you are struck, fight back. If they try to shoot you, kill them. In other words, Dosti advocated for self-defense, nothing more. This is not how newspapers reported it, saying that Dosti called for an absolute massacre. Within a few days, the dentist would be injured so thoroughly that he died from his wounds. On the day of the convention, as planned, a group of supporters, hundreds of them, many in their Union soldier outfits, in parade, fifes and drums, march down Canal Street to the Mechanics Institute, located in what's uh, the Marini District. And along the way, there's tussles. The same New York Times reporter says there were crowds that just looked mean and ugly coming out of the local bars. One man said it looked like he would be pushed down by them. And indeed, they do push down a few of these marchers. There's a scuffle. At one point, there's some pistol shots. But this is a large crowd, and they're able to fight back. And they reach the street in front of the Mechanics Institute. Within the middle of the block, there forms a crowd of mostly white men. It starts with taunts. Police are mingled with the crowd. At first, it appears they might be trying to keep order. There's some taunts, and verbal goes to physical, and then there's gunshots. And then police just start clubbing and firing. Finding no quarter in the street, many of the men outside then run into the Mechanics Institute, seeking safety. And as we described, a mob larger than they, and better armed, will enter the Institute For the first hour, at least, the intention of every police officer on the scene is not to arrest, but to shoot everyone there. Later, there will be arrests. Some of the people are beaten on the way to the wagon. In the end of it, over 50 people at the Mechanics Institute are dead. Most of them African-American citizens of the United States fighting for freedom, encouraged by the new constitutional amendments that they now have rights that states can't take away. White men who were also their allies in this. One, a former governor of the state, hundreds more wounded. Only one attacker was killed, shot accidentally by a policeman's revolver. It was a murder, which the mayor and the police of this city perpetrated without the shadow of a necessity. Phil Sheridan, to his commander, Ulysses S. Grant. A poem in La Tribune the African-American Creole newspaper of New Orleans called Ode to the Martyrs appears just days after the killings. When history shows that merit is oppressed, when crime is honored and virtue is suppressed, at such misdeeds, such crime we take offense, we prefer to be buried in a chasm of ignorance. 
a foolish wish, for memories of vice give memories of good a higher price. The soul on virtues weighed against sin's pains, with greater interest pauses and then remains. No evil cannot by remorse be set right, nor can be absolved and hid in death's dark night. There is an avenger whose unrelenting hand shatters the tomb and makes the guilty stand, saddened by the shame of truth's harsh light, before the judgment of the reader's spite. Our voices denounces both his life and his crimes. We curse his ashes on behalf of his many victims. We forgive heaven, whose knowing justice gave unto the wicked life beyond the grave, and forging punishment from former delights shows him in worldly triumph, hellish sights, which torturing his nights, poisoning his days, like a sword o'erhanging, threatening him always. May all the oppressed take heart in this idea. The events in New Orleans, along with another bloody riot that killed over 40 people in Memphis recently, are put at the feet of President Andrew Johnson now. This is what the New York Tribune says. This event in New Orleans is intended to begin a reign of terror in the South. Any time you have a convention or try to change government, you will have the sword and bullets. Here's what the New York Tribune says as well. It links President Johnson to the riot's pistol. It is he who engendered the spirit which broke forth in the riot, murdered loyalists, and finally raised the Confederate flag over American soil again. Now, no witnesses support any raising of Confederate flags during this event, but it's probably flourish. But you get the idea. The Chicago Tribune says, The participants prove their devotion to the president's policy by a riot or massacre inaugurated to suppress free speech. Edwin Stanton, the war secretary, makes it clear the president is the author of the riot. And Thomas Nast, with his excellent cartoons, had a cartoon that put... Andrew Johnson, along with his king's crown, which was how he's depicted at this point, opening a door and entering the mechanic's hall and viewing the riot, smiling. Now, he had no role directly in this, but he did, however, give assurances to the New Orleans local authorities, both that they could govern, they could hire police, and that there would be no interference in what the government had to do to enforce the law. Carl Schurz, leading Republican, said, if any man ought to be hanged, it is Johnson. And there's charges and counter charges. Congress is going to investigate. The U.S. military is going to conduct investigations, none of which look good for the local police in New Orleans. There will be some counter charges. There is a minority report in Congress that says that it was Dosti that is the author of the riot and that his fanatical statements enraged people, that he had made a comment about, we have more numbers and we will win. And added with flourish, and no source for it than an opposition newspaper, white citizens of Louisiana would be put to death. So there's also counter charges that the radicals who conducted the convention were in cahoots with radicals in the U.S. Congress. And so that because of the interference of people like Benjamin Wade and Thaddeus Stevens, there was blood in New Orleans and the blood's on their hands. Those charges didn't stick as well in the politics of the day. In fact, the results of the Mechanics Institute riot and along with the events in Memphis, the results of the wood smacking the pulp in many newspapers with illustrations of the horror of that day was to give Republicans something that's very rare in American history for one party to have a super majority to be able to override President Johnson's veto and to, in effect, run the government of the United States, almost ignore him until the point they couldn't, and then try to impeach him. We should note that this whole debate over African-American suffrage in one state, Louisiana, is going to be solved years later. In fact, uh, Louisiana will now elect a Reconstruction government. Benjamin Flanders, Reconstruction Republican, will become governor. They'll, Republicans will take the legislature in the state. The GOP will control Louisiana until 1877. Louisiana will establish the right of African Americans to vote. And then the nation, among those who will run the government of Louisiana at different times, will be Oscar Dunn and PBS Pinchback. Both of them will serve as 
lieutenant governors, and both are African American, and this is in the 1860s and 70s. Pinchback was born free and raised in Ohio and moved to New Orleans. Dunn was born a slave, then became free and was a successful carpenter who owned a cooperative bakery for working men in New Orleans. For a short period, with an absence of a governor, Pinchback, the lieutenant, will become governor of the state of Louisiana, the first African-American governor of a U.S. state. That will not happen again until 1989. The Mechanics Institute riot, which is really a downplaying of what it is, it's really a massacre, is one of the most significant events when you study the politics behind Reconstruction, the period after the Civil War, and the power positioning of both President Andrew Johnson, who otherwise may have done well in the 1866 midterms, or were well enough, or staved uh, the, the usual loss that occurs with presidents, and may have run for re-election seriously in 1868, maybe on the Democratic Party, maybe in his own third party. After the Mechanics Institute, this became not possible. His radical Republicans took over. Louisiana will cast its votes for Ulysses S. Grant in the 1868 presidential election. Under the Grant administration, the 15th Amendment, allowing the vote for all men regardless of their race, passes through Congress and is ratified by the states in 1870. Louisiana is the fifth state to ratify it. Grant said of it, it is the most important event since the nation came alive. I want to thank you for listening. The website is www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com. We have a Patreon site. Thank you for those who are uh, supporting me on that. Get some extra content there. Patreon.com slash MHC, B-U-I-P, the letters of my history can beat up your politics. Thanks for listening.